Welcome everybody once again. It is really my great pleasure today to introduce Veronica Visa, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Austrian Academy of Sciences and trained as a cultural historian of late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. She obtained her PhD in 2015 from the University of Vienna with a thesis on apocalyptic thought in late antiquity. Her thesis, which was awarded a PhD prize, Dr. Maria Schaumeyer Stiftung in 2016, will be published next year for the Greuther. Veronica research focuses mainly on apocalyptic thought, historiography, and perception of space and peoples, which, is a topic, which are topics that she tackles with an interdisciplinary and comparative approach. Of the different projects she led, I will only mention the 2020-2023 project, Mapping Medieval People, Visualizing Semantic Landscapes in Early Medieval Europe, that was a database project will, which will go online in mid-December, so, so stay tuned for that. And uh, this year, she also won a fellowship to join the research unit Migration and Mobility in Late Antiquity in the Early Middle Ages at the University of Tübingen. Among her publications instead, I would like to mention volumes one and five of the series Historiography and Identity, co-edited with Walter, Walter Bohr and Francesco Bori. In the co-edition of the volumes Cultures and Eschatology, the book chapter Reading Jerome's De Viris Illustribus in the Post-Roman World, or the article Writing Strategies, Medieval Biographical Collections. Today, Veronica will present a paper entitled Reduce, Reuse, Recycle, Structure and Autorial Strategies and Methodological Problems in Gennadius of Marseille, De Viris Illustribus. Veronica, the floor is all yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Georgia, and um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very much looking forward to discuss my thoughts on Gennadius' catalogue with you. And as Georgia has already mentioned, and yeah, maybe could you could you make me co-host? Then maybe I start. Um, I just start a PowerPoint while I'm speaking. Um, so um, these these thoughts are the result of a case study that I conducted with my colleague Graham Ward, and um, we wrote an article um so an article resulted of it just let me quickly so here just just a sec um so can you see can you see my screen can you see the powerpoint yes let me know okay great so if you are interested in this article it was published with medieval worlds last year Okay, reflections on um, medieval Christian traditions on biographical and genealogical writings usually start in late antiquity with the works of Eusebius, of Caesarea and Jerome and their efforts to document uh, the growth of Christian communities across the Roman Empire. In their works, works, Christian past and present are seen through the lives of men, through their deeds, miracles and um, most important literary works. Jerome's bio-bibliographic compendium of authorities on illustrious men, which was written in 392-393, was foundational. So on the slide, you can see a first page with a table of contents from a manuscript from the 9th century. It starts with the entry on the Apostle Simon Petrus. Jerome collected 135 mainly Christian authors of the past four centuries, whose texts were considered central for the church. He combined classical Greco-Latin biographical traditions with Christian apologetics. Each biography was defined by an individual's literary output. The catalog was read and used as a source of information for over a millennium. Up to the 15th century, 173 Complete manuscripts survive, considering fragments and excerpts. The number jumps up to 450. And this, to be clear, is a remarkably high number. But yet medieval reception has often stood in contrast to modern criticism, which once considered the catalogue an incomplete, rushed and biased work. But recently, historians have begun to reappraise Jerome. So Jerome's list of authors was expanded and continued, and Gennadius' continuation was one moment in this long reception history. Gennadius intended his work to be a direct continuation, and he adhered in content and structure to the original. And this is echoed in the manuscript tr transmission of both texts, which were, with a few exceptions, always transmitted together. 
So on the slide, you can see the prologue of the one of the earliest extant manuscripts from the seventh century, which was written at the monastery of Corby, north of Paris. In this manuscript, Gennadius starts, um, his text starts immediately after Jerome's with the first entry on uh, James or Jacob of Nisibis. And this is the picture on the right. On the left is the end of Jerome's text. And at the bottom, there's an additional information about the end of one text and the beginning of the next text. So in the following, I would like to talk about Gennadius' specific approach as continuator, as author, about strategies of authority, about the tensions that are inherent to such a continuation and reworking, um, tensions between the thematic foci and agendas introduced through different author continuators, and how a continuation could be adapted to reflect the needs of later audiences. So sometime in the 460s, 470s, roughly 80 years after Jerome, Gennadius, a presbyter, a priest in Marseille, set out to continue Jerome's collection to his own days, adding nearly 100 authors and their literary accomplishments. Whereas we have a ton of information about Jerome at our disposal, we know very little about Gennadius. In fact, the only contemporary information about him and his works is contained in the last entry to the continuation. It is formulated in the first person perspective and it echoes the layout of Jerome's last entry, highlighting the literary merits of the catalogue's composer. Therein five major works and one letter, which mainly deal with different heresies and topics of eschatology, were attributed to Gennadius, either by himself or shortly after his death, by someone who knew him and his works very well. From the knowledge displayed in the catalogue, we can safely assume that Gennadius was well connected to the ascetic circles at Marseille and in southern Gaul but no affiliation to a specific local community or monastery can be deduced conclusively. Therefore, it is difficult to access uh, the author's motives and background, as well as the context of the catalogue directly. However, we do have circumstantial evidence about the world in which Gennadius was writing, as well as we are able to gain access to the religious landscape through his selection and comments on Christian authors and their beliefs. So let's take a closer look. Gennadius' aim was not only to continue and update, but also to complement Jerome's work. He tried to fill in gaps, or what he perceived to be gaps, and offer explanations for missing information or for missing entries of teachers who seemed important to him. But first, writing about Christian authorities, he had to establish himself as an authority as well, as someone who was qualified to collect these biographies and to continue Jerome's work. The first chapter of the collection is a good example for both aspects. It treats James the Wise, uh, who was Bishop of Nisibis in modern Turkey in the first half of the fourth century. His oeuvre comprised 26 books. He was characterized as an opponent of Arianism and a key figure in the Nicene controversy, but he had not been concluded in Jerome's catalogue. And according to Gennadius, the only reasonable ex explanation for his omission was a language barrier rather than a matter of the bishop's worthiness. The fact that, as Gennadius stated, Jerome's information on Syrian bishops had been drawn from Greek translations suggested that Jerome, unlike Gennadius himself, it seems, would not read Syriac. But at least this is what Gennadius wants us to know. Actively reflecting on his predecessor's choices and sometimes even adjusting them to the focus of his own compilation was an important part of Gennadius' work. And this meant going back chronologically to the second half of the fourth century, earlier than the date of Jerome's catalogue. In the first chapters of Gennadius' continuation, the Desert Fathers of Egypt, the heartland of monasticism at that time, play a prominent role. Pachomius, monk and abbot of Tabernisi, who is considered one of the founding fathers of the Egyptian monastic tradition, his successor at the monastery, a fellow monk, as well as two other 
well-known Egyptian aesthetics, Macarius and Evagrius, a portrait. In comparison to the literary achievements of others, theirs, while well, a letter and an untitled treatise, seem less accomplished. However, Gennadius had a keen interest in the proponents of monastic life, especially in the Egyptian monastic practice that had been emulated in Marseille in southern Gaul. And this is one thematic foci, monasticism, that cannot be found in Jerome's catalogue. So let's take a closer look at that. I just want to know, sometimes there is a lot of text on the slide, but you don't have, to, I don't expect you to read everything. I will paraphrase everything, so please don't, don't stress. So more text, a lot of text. Starting with the ascetic foundations that sprang up in the second half of the fourth century in Aquitaine, Southern Gaul with communities in Lorraine, Mamoutier, Primoliacum and Marseille had become a hotspot of asceticism in the Western Empire by the turn of the century. At Marseille in particular, Cassian's visions of a poor and strict monastic life modeled on the first apostolic community circulated. In the catalogue, Gennadius provided a lengthy account of the monk Cassian, who, after having spent many years at the Egyptian monasteries, came to southern Gaul sometime in the 420s. His works, especially those on the spiritual teachings of the Desert Fathers, on the institutes and the conferences, resound strongly in Gennadius' catalogue. In later chapters, he mentions fellow ascetics, friends like Eucherius of Lyon or Salvian of Marseille, in order to show that Cassian's ideas, and in particular his anti-Nestorian writings, were still influential decades later. So apparently it was very important to Gennadius to inscribe Cassian onto the Marseille community, thereby claiming his theological legacy and buttressing a monastic tradition in Gaul with him as a central player. In this respect, Cassian also served as an important intermediary to connect the local monastic context in, of Marseille and southern Gaul, represented by the circles at Marseille and Lorraine, with the earlier authoritative Eastern monastic traditions depicted in the accounts of Pachomius and his monks. Besides ascetic and monks, the other main protagonists of Gennadius' catalogue are the influential theologians of his time and the writers of the Catholic Church and the battles against dissenting doctrines. Here again, Gennadius emphasizes those doctrinal conflicts and controversies which had been present in Gaul, and he himself claimed to have written treatises about against Nestorius, Pelagius, and Eutychus. So let's take a look at Gennadius' methodological approach. Comparing Gennadius and Jerome's works and their approaches, it becomes apparent that Jerome's entries are on the whole a bit more systematically structured and contain more biographical and context-related information. At the beginning of each entry, Jerome seeks to give as much information about the writer's context as his sources allowed him, starting with information about an individual's origin, office, see, discipleship. These details are complemented by a brief characterization of an individual's ability, such as he was a man of chaste eloquence, and then of his writings, often noting the context of their production. The reigns of emperors provide the main chronological framework. Gennadius' entries, on the other hand, are sometimes characterized by brevity, like the first example. So Macarius, he was another monk, as we learn in chapter 28, or in chapter 31, um, we are told about another John, Bishop of Jerusalem, who had written one book. Its content is roughly sketched, but without stating a title. So this lack of information in some of Gennadius' entries makes it sometimes a bit difficult to clearly discern about whom Gennadius was writing, thus making the use of the catalogue at times difficult, especially when one um, imagines that later audiences read and used the catalogue and did not have um, the knowledge of Gennadius' um, context at hand. 
When Jerome and Gennadis, what they have in common is their interpretation of biographical information as a means to deprecate theologians and scholars they did not approve of. Helvidius, for instance, against whom Jerome had written a fierce treatise, is described by Gennadius as a mediocre writer who, quote, wrote with the seal up for religion, but not according to knowledge, a book polished neither in language nor in reasoning, which is quite a devastating review, actually. Gennadius here seems to have endorsed Jerome's assessment of Helvidius. In other entries, Gennadius' role not only as a compiler, but also as a corrector becomes more evident, especially in those entries where he adds comments about his own reading experiences, such as the first quote, I have only read one of Bakarius' books, or I have read also three books on faith which bear his, Theophilus, name, but as the language is not like his, I do not very much, much think they are by him. So such comments, which appear sporadically throughout the catalogue, serve to bolster Gennadius' credibility as compiler and author and authenticate the works he quotes. Moreover, they create a personal perspective connecting the compiler and the authors mentioned. So much of what Gennadius included uh, into his catalogue was not only selected and modified according to his authorial choices, but also depended on the sources of information at his disposal. On a few rare occasions, he quotes his sources of information, but usually he does not. He most likely had access to stories and knowledge and books provided by the local monasteries in Marseille, but we do not have any detailed information about the context he, he was working in. What we can grasp from the catalogue is that exiled bishops who play a role in the catalogue would have sent or carried letters and works of other authors. And this can be especially seen in the last entries to the catalogue, which feature Nicene North African bishops that had come to Southern Gaul, such as Eugenius, Bishop of Carthage, who was exiled to Gaul, to Vienne, and who composed a book which he sent to Gennadius. And of course, um, another factor was political change. So in the approximately 80 years between Jerome and Gennadius' biographical collections, the political landscape of the Western Roman Empire had undergone a series of changes set in motion by civil wars and military conflicts. In the decades when Gennadius was writing in the 460s and 70s, he saw the breakdown of imperial rule in the Western Roman Empire, the increase of Visigothic dominion, and in the 480s, the rise of the new power of the Franks in northern Gaul. His hometown, Marseille, fell under the control of King Euric in the 470s and remained a part of the Visigothic kingdom for the next 30 years. And it is again this background Gennadius started working off his catalogue. And of course, the catalogue was not intended to be a source of information on, on politics, on the political developments that had taken place. And there are indeed no explicit details provided concerning the shift from late Roman to Visigothic rule in southern Gaul. However, it was nevertheless entangled in the political transitions and theological controversies happening at the author's doorstep. And we do find echoes of contemporary political developments. So in the first chapter um, of the catalogue on uh, James the Wise, we learn in passing about the fighting between Roman and Sasanian armies and the subsequent surrender of Nisibis and the Emperor, Emperor Jovian in 363. And in the second quote in chapter 85, about Prosper of Aquitaine, we are told of the sack of Rome in 455, and these details are embedded into the account on Prosper. And in general, throughout the catalogue, there is an intermittent mention of the active involvement of bishops and priests in ecclesiastical controversies and of the connection to the imperial court as preachers or advisors, and which is the first quote or of their involvement as experts or intermediaries in religious debates, which is the second quote. 
as participants at church councils or simply as outspoken opponents against Epras. We can observe that imperial history becomes relevant primarily when it provides the background and the cause for an author's literary engagement. In particular, this concerns the resistance of holy man against the pro-Aryan preference of barbarian rulers, with Arianism being one of the main late antique theological controversies. Um, there are many entries in the catalog that refer to this theological debate, and they were included most often because of an author's anti-Aryan attitude, which Gennadius shared. And this concerns especially the North African context and, the con and also Gaul. So this is uh, the first, first example on the slide. Gennadius' emphasis of the importance of orthodox belief can be seen to some extent in the light of this new situation, with new Visigothic rulers following Arian creed. In the catalogue, he stresses this point by praising the works of orthodox Gallic writers, such as Vincent of Laurent's collection of heresies, this is the second quote, and um, Faustus of Rie, which is the third quote, and his work against the Arians and Macedonians and his treatise to Grecos. Gennadius criticized those who, in his opinion, divided the community. He criticized those who had, quote, left the church, the Catholic faith, and had gone over to the Nestorian impiety, just as the above-mentioned Grecos, who was Bishop of Marseille, had. So, to conclude, the catalogue, while following Jerome's uh, structure closely, also reflects the specialized context of later 5th century Southern Gaul. Uh, providing its readers with instructions to find their way through a world of competing theological doctrines and interpretations, and the many new ascetic movements and communities that had sprouted. Gennady's catalogue was was therefore far from being only a tool for preserving knowledge. The snippets of information about the political developments and mainly ecclesiastical debates formed the backdrop to the literary accomplishments of Christian writers and created another dynamic narrative layer linking authors, fellow theologians, bishop and rulers. Jerome and Gennady's often included representatives of both sides of a theological controversy, and thus help to preserve to a certain degree knowledge of them. Their works, however, were nevertheless geared towards a specific interpretation of these debates, emphasizing the learnedness and superiority of orthodox theologians over their dissident counterparts. This skewed image, moreover, was then transmitted throughout the centuries. The writings of the losers in doctrinal debates were often not preserved, surviving only in the very catalogues that were written to challenge them. But not only the context, but also the audiences for whom biobibliographical catalogues were written and read would differ remarkably. The catalogues often spoke to specific local communities and audiences, which might have been conscious of the ongoing controversies described. In this respect, catalogues could be used as a means to establish various different forms of cohesion, social, cultural, doctrinal. But while contemporary readers would have been familiar with the specific local contexts the mentioned authors were working and living in, later audiences access the world of the fifth century through the lens of the compilers thus probably accessing a more homogeneous picture than it would have actually been the case. Finally, the various illustrious tradition presented an archive of received and lost knowledge and allowed otherwise unknown authors to remain part of Christian literary communities. For Gennadius, but also for Jerome, it is not at all clear how many of the texts preserved by them were actually available to be read. And even for Jerome, much of the record of the earlier Greek past was already a memory. Especially for the audiences in much later centuries, in the Carolingian period, for instance, 
Most of the authorities listed in the catalogues were long since dead and could no longer be linked to a particular community or religious institution. Yet evidently, the loss of so much of the corpus did not diminish the value in copying the catalogue. It was surely satisfying when specific treatises could be checked against Jerome's and Gennady's lists, but that should not draw attention away from appreciating that a collected body of Christian writing formed a key part of the church's corporate self-awareness. Jerome and Gennady's catalogues were as much a record of what had been written as of what could and should be read. Gennady's decision to continue Jerome's catalogue confirmed its authoritative character and its relevance for the Christian community and thus contributed to its reuse and continuation. And from this, this perspective, the nature of the collection was absolutely central. The success of the text and the genre as a whole lay in the accumulation of authority. So I have arrived at the end of my papers. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for a very interesting presentation um of a very interesting context um we're opening the floor now to questions i'm gonna throw the first one in if that's okay um in gennadius work the additions and um is there any uh preposterous um account obviously wrong about the uh, character before him did he add something that it's where he really messed it up hmm where he really messed it up. I think I have not encountered that. What I have encountered, well, sometimes his entries are very specialized. Um, so I think one account, for instance, on Sulpicius, which is in the context of Gaul as well, was a little bit, um, well, not wrong, but a little bit wrong in the details, uh, which kind of also shows that Gennadius is not a 100% reliable source. It's not historical information. It's both historical and fictional information. Huh, but what is more important, Augustine's account. So that's maybe a remarkable example because Augustine's account, account is very short, really short. And he did not include um, the city of God. He didn't include that. And confessions, not mentioned there. And this might have to do something probably with the Pelagian, same Pelagian controversy, because Cassian and the communities in Marseille were not as much opposed to Pelagius as Augustine was. And um, Gennadius does include um, critis, tr critics of Pelagius and opponents, and he ha himself had written a treatise against Pelagius, but he also included those like Faustus of Rie who, who had kind of defended them him and had a more moderate approach to him and so kind of leaving out books in Augustine's account and it's a very short one could maybe can be understood as an indirect criticism of Augustine in this respect so maybe, very very interesting maybe there yes thank you yeah, well, that there. could be an example where it goes off the rails in a bit in a sense um Mateus uh, question from Mateus and then from um, Georgia Thanks so much. This was really interesting. Uh, I have a question that actually feeds into uh, the previous one. Um, I have a question about the um, whether there is a operant operative principle behind the ordering of uh, the biographies in Canadius. Um, and that relates to the previous question because I do know of an example of one biography that seems to imply that an author, in that case Commodianus, who is widely dated in general to the third century, uh, if we assume that there is a chronological principle of Canadius, he would seem to be a contemporary of Prudentius. And there is nothing in the text of Commodianus that would suggest that. Uh, whereas Canadius, who is a, one of the very, very few sources on Commodianus, uh, it would suggest that it is actually he is actually a roughly contemporary, maybe slightly earlier uh, author to Canadius. So my question is, is there a um a principle like that and if there is is there a problem with the dating of some of the authors thank you ah that's that's a good question on Commodianos. Huh? um 
because dating Covandianos is still, I think, I think it's, or maybe you know that more precisely if it has been kind of solved or not solved, because some people date him in the in the beginning of the fifth century and some in the third. So no, so actually um, the catalog is um, organized roughly uh, chronologically, um, actually picking picking up where uh, Jerome has left off in the three nineties. But also going a little bit previously, if he, if Gennady thought it would be worthwhile and important to include someone, um, such as the monks and abbots from from Egypt, um, but mainly these were kind of contemporaries. So the last entries are um, from Gennady's time, so from the four eighties and four nineties. So that's that's the end of, um, and some of them were still living. So he was also writing and including those um, some of his contemporaries that were still kind of around. Yeah. Thank you, Georgia. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was really fascinating. And um, I have several questions, but I start with one and I hope I'll try to formulate it clearly. Um, I was very interested in what you said more explicitly towards the end. And uh, the question stems from the fact that I'm really interested in seeing how through doctoral controversies, people try to get through the message of who's good and who's bad. So I was wondering how do how does Gennadius portray and makes it clear whether somebody is on the good or on the bad side. Is this just through moral characterization? Because I saw in the last examples or the good people were very were with a very good nature. So does it go in depth in doctrinal controversy studying what's wrong with what they think or they're just very bad people altogether? Thanks. It's, it's, thanks. Thanks for the question. It's, it's kind of the, of a mixture. I think um, commenting about someone's learnedness and his style of writing was also kind, he used that as a characterization of the content of somebody's works, especially when uh, it concerned um, theologians that belong to, to the Aryan or Homusian side. Um, but, but mainly he stated it quite clearly that the road treatises that he did not approve or that were not approved, that were disapproved by many others. And um, so he was quite, quite, um, quite open, or quite outspoken of on that. Um, I just, um... but yeah, there, there, there are many actually. There, Arianism mm -hmm. is one, but also um, Nestorianism, Pelagianism. So actually that's one of the main narrative strands uh, in the catalog. Um, that's it, it. It's against heresies, or that's for what Gennadius believed um, the Orthodox community should look like. But it's very clear who he disapproves and approves. But does he go into detail in saying why the treatises are bad and people should not read them, or is just no, this is bad? Sometimes, sometimes he explicates a little bit more, but usually the paragraphs. So Cassian's is is one of the longest chapters in the catalog and this is more of a list of what he has written so there is not a, a lot of space actually to comment so usually it's a, it's a sentence or two sentences why why a treatise is not not approved of yeah fascinating thank you thank you Matteo please Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pisser, for this uh, presentation. Maybe my question would be a little bit of topic. Sorry if it is not so smart. But um, uh, about the these authority and Oriental authorities, which Gen uh, that Genadius uh, wants to include, and um, have you any ideas of his knowledge of the Oriental authorities? Uh, I mean, in the Orient beyond Byzantium. Because sometimes, uh, yes, I I study Syriac, and sometimes I find news, uh, I find uh, informations on Syriac authors, which were not translated into Greek. For example, the disciples of Ephraim, Isaac of Antioch, mm -hmm. the Kichu Isaacs of Antioch, and others. So sometimes, I uh, I can't understand uh, from where Genadius comes from 
and uh, which are his sources and uh, I have so many questions from Gennadius and uh, um, so I have this and so he wants I think to include also for my for example the, the two informations about Isaac's the two Isaacs of Antioch are Antioch are I think in, in, interesting because one of them wrote uh, um, uh, uh, on the Holy Spirit for example the spirit of to something like that and we cannot understand but um, if you have any ideas about his oriental authorities program i don't know how how to say it thank you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you thank you for the question so that's 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 an important question um and i think to some extent so first of all we cannot really be sure if Gennadius knew Zurich or if it didn't because this is i think is it's it's the only instance in the catalog where he mentions that in the account on James of Nisibis. And to some extent, it might just have been the reason or the urge of him to establish himself as an authority. Um, equally to Jerome, um, not not surpassing him, but, but at least equally to, to Jerome. Um, or he just thought, um, so I think in the process, of uh, compiling this catalog, he also reflected a lot on Jerome's choices and why Jerome included some authors or why he left out some others. And um, so Jerome had no interest in the monastic traditions. This is not a topic that's, well, in De Virus Illustribus, in his catalog, we don't have any mention. So maybe maybe on Anthony, but that's it. It's, it's at least just one entry. I, I compared them, but Gennadius has a very strong interest in them. And we know that in, in Gaul and Aquitaine, there's a strong, um, how do you say, the ascetic tradition. Uh, so because Severus, he, he read Life of Athanasius, uh, Martin of Tours, they were very much inspired by the Eastern monks and by the Eastern communities. Uh, Cassian, so we find Cassian was a monk in the Egyptian monasteries before he came to Gaul. So um, there are many, many figures that served as a kind of uh, conduit of knowledge between the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire, specifically with regard to ascetic traditions. Mm, and then we do have, so the catalog is a little bit biased. So it's not, there is a strong, um, we have much more, um, writers and scholars from the Western part of the Roman Empire than from the Eastern part. And I think from the Western part, it's there are two thirds from the Western part of the Roman Empire and only one third of the Eastern part. And among these from the Western parts, we have a strong, it's not half, but it's around 40% coming from Gaul. So, and although Gennadius wants to link, um, once wants to link kind of the monastic communities and the scholars throughout the Mediterranean, he still has a strong focus on what is going on in Gaul. But it's difficult to tell where he exactly had his knowledge on, on Syriac authors, but we know that he, well, Marseille was, was a port that was still well-functioning, even, even in the times of political change. So the, would have been a lot of going on actually there, messages arriving or of fellow ascetics or exiled bishops and carrying information and in books or something like that. So I hope I have answered your questions. Yeah, thank you very much. No, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, his interest in uh, for his Gaulic uh, uh, part is uh, really clear. For example, he translated uh, um, also ascetic texts. Uh, he said that he translated himself ascetic texts, for example, of uh, Evagrius into into Latin or revised the translation mm -hmm. of so so monastic literature. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I believe Andy was waving around. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think in direct relation to this mention of James of Nisibis, my immediate reaction when you started mentioning him was that it, it's because Jerome mentions him in the Chronicle. And there's, a, there's an entry to James of Nisibis. I'm not sure where the other information is coming from, but maybe, what is it? Is it Socrates, Socrates or Theodora, Georgia? I think that would, would be my 
suggestion that might have something to do with that. Um, and then my question to that would be, if if it is, if this is the reason why it's included, because Jerome mentions it in his chronicle, is there any other evidence of other writings by Jerome that are influencing Genadius that you might not that I, that he might have picked up on? That's a, that's a good question, but it's a little bit difficult to tell because of the generic nature of the catalog. So there's there is information going on, and we can kind of. Um, Take a closer look at thematic strands and thematic foci, but only to some to some extent. Also, we can't really go very deep into the catalog, or only if we really know well the context of a specific author. But some do remain a little bit more vague and shadowy. Um, just let me think a bit further on that. We see that Genadius also includes. Um, Arthur's Jerome did not improve of, like Rufinus, for instance. So, of course, Jerome did not include Rufinus in his catalog, but Gennadius actually did, because he thought he would be really important as a as a translator and, yeah, as a kind of um, conduit between the Eastern and Western world. But from the Chronicle, no, I don't know. But surely they had they had um, a Latin and a Greek version of Jerome's chronicling Gaul, or we know at least that Sulpicius had one, and that the Chronicle also um, was disseminated quite quite quickly, also in the Western parts. Yeah. Um, and his, yeah, probably Eusebius ecclesiastical histories. I have a question um, on authorial strategies, right? Um, and I'm, I'm interested in other areas in that situation where um, historiographer of any kind or puts them put themselves at the end of it. To give an example, broadly speaking, if Hegel would write a history of philosophy, my, it might end up with him. And it might make the whole history look like a development towards himself, right? And with Jerome, he ends with himself. And it's slightly developed there. And you can see he's put in a direction. What's happening with uh, Gennadius? Is he fin I think he's finishing with himself. But mm -hmm. can you see uh, w whether he's with that move? Is he in, you know, giving an impulse to the whole thing in any way? I think um, Gennadius, um, so we can't be 100% sure if a Gennadius account, if he included it himself or if he included, if he was, it, if it was included a tiny bit later, because the last entries, um, well, at least the last five or six entries could suggest that they could have been, well, yeah, added by later hand, but this is, I don't know, we can't really but we can assume kind of, I would rather assume that Gennadius had um, added himself simply because he was following what Jerome did. But the account is is much shorter and uh, in Jerome's catalog, there's kind of an, yeah, self-aggrandizement. It's, it's a very, very long entry and it's the longest I think in the catalog and it also says a lot of what Jerome thought about himself being an accomplished Christian writer, of course, um, and one of the maybe key figures of yeah Christian Christian traditions, Christian literary traditions. But that's that's an important uh, foci of Jerome's catalog in general, that he wanted to prove that Christian writers were were able and as eloquent as um, pagan literary traditions, and yeah. And also had um, many, many examples of learnedness and eloquence and yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, Flora, please. Yes, I, I would like to elaborate on this a little bit because I find it enormously interesting uh, to see the difference uh, uh, between the two authors of the catalogue and the continuation on the one hand and the addition on the other hand, depending uh, partly on the languages they knew and the location uh, they 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 uh, were um, in the sense that um, 
yeah, the, the importance of the monastic life uh, with Cassianus, etc., is is greater in in Gennadius, uh, doesn't uh, feature in in Jerome. But um, then I come to my uh, thing that you have the difference between uh, the authors because they are subjects, human subjects, which means that the rendering, the historiographic rendering, is subjective in a certain sense. Yeah. But then my question is, do you have an idea of the reception of the two catalogues and the authority that was given to the two catalogues? In a sense, was it necessary to have a how to use the catalogue uh, in order to uh, be able to decipher uh, the content of the two catalogues? Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's that's a very... Um... That's a very good um important element. Um, I think one um so the other reason why Jerome compiled this catalog uh was also to have a handbook, to have a handbook in well um yeah, Christian Christian communities were debating quite a lot in the fourth century and fifth centuries, a lot of controversies. And he saw that there would be kind of the use of a handbook as a source of information that could be used in these debates that um, people could refer to and could kind of um, use to um, to know actually what others were talking about and what what is orthodox and what not, would not be judged orthodox at a specific point in time. So, and this character of a handbook as a reference in debate that remains throughout the early Middle Ages. And it was used as a source of um, information, also as a source of historical information, uh, which is quite important to keep in mind, especially when we know that this catalog is not really an objective catalog or they are very specific um, principles, how it is organized and ordered and who's included and his, who's left out. And, and we know that in, in the Carolingian period, um, it was more often used, or we have one example from Frechus of Lisieux, who was a Carolingian well, writer. He wrote uh, the histories and he used um, Jerome's catalogue a lot, actually, in his in his histories. So we do have a more of a historiographical approach to that. Yeah. Uh, also similar other late antique authors like Orosius, for instance, were used as a source of information about these Christian communities of late antiquity. Um, I believe we have uh, one more question from Georgia. Yes, thank you very much. It actually uh, builds up on the previous two questions. And uh, the background of it is that um, Syriac collective biographies tend to be very unstable throughout tradition. It's very common that the people mentioned change, that the name change and they grow and uh, and are abridged and so on. So I was wondering, because if I remember correctly, you mentioned that we have a huge manuscript tradition from this work. So I was wondering how stable is this tradition and did his authorial imprint in a way worked to keep the collection together in a stable form? Mm, uh, that's a good question. I think especially in the case of Jerome and Gennadius, they were most often transmitted together from a very early stage onwards. So, so the picture I showed is a manuscript from the 7th century, but we also have one from the 6th century where they have already been used together. And we know from a, from a fellow theologian, from Cassiodorus, that both of them, Jerome and Gennadius, should be used as a source of information, as a kind of a handbook. And um, we do have continuations with Isidore of Seville and Ildefons of Toledo, so in the 7th, 8th centuries. But then we have a large, large gap. Then we don't have any, any more continuations after that um, until the 15th, 16th century. So... At some point, um, at some point, this kind of uh, continuing it kind of stopped apparently, but I, it was still used. It was still used as a handbook. So, kind of continuing the tradition was at some point um, 
not a topic anymore or not not a tradition that that was continued but it was still important because it was still copied thank you mm. And um, on this note, uh, well, I would like to, um, if no other questions, um, very urgent questions pop in right now. I'd like to thank our speaker today um, for an excellent paper and to our audience for joining in. Thank you thank very you. much again. And thank you very much for your questions and for your feedback. So thanks a lot. Thank you once again, Veronica, for the presentation and thanks to everybody who joined. Very good seeing everyone. See you next time. We have two more to go this year. Yeah. Uh, ideally. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Thanks, about everyone. That. Have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice Thank day. you. Bye. 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 Bye.